Why do bad things happen to good people? And for Christians, more pointedly, why does God allow bad things to happen to good people? That's a powerful and important question for us to grapple with as Christians. And you know, today, we live in a culture that's filled with woundedness. There's a lot of brokenness in our culture. And so why does God allow that kind of broken, that kind of brokenness, that kind of wounds? You know, I just had a dear friend whose wife of 35 years just left him. And you know, why, why does God allow those kinds of things to happen? You know, I think there's an answer. You know, St. Uh, Joseph in the Old Testament, after suffering mightily for many years, being sold as a slave, betrayed by his own brothers, and going through great affliction, can look back at his life at the end, and he could say to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. And St. Paul in Romans 8 says the same thing. He talks about how all things work together for good for those that love Jesus Christ, right? And there's an old Latin phrase, omnia in bonum, all for the good, right? Think of an oyster or a clam or a, 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 uh, that has that irritant in it. And that irritant, that, that negative thing, it could be a worm, it could be something in there that's, that's bad. What does the oyster or clam do? It forms a pearl. It surrounds that irritant, that foreign debris that's a wound, and it surrounds it and it forms a pearl. You know, that's what God intends for us, as St. Augustine says, that God allows evil in order to draw out greater good in the end. We need to understand that when it comes to all the pain and hurt in our own lives and the lives of others. And Christian hope points the way towards the healing that Christ can give. And that's what we're going to talk about on tonight's show. Well, it's a pleasure for me to be joined tonight by a special guest, Sister Miriam. She is a very inspirational and phenomenal national speaker on the Catholic speaking circuit. I've seen her at Legatus Conference and uh, Focus Conferences and many other things. She gives a very inspiring testimony. She speaks on the issues of mercy, forgiveness, authentic love, uh, healing. I know she has a, an incredible ministry that's taking off for healing for clergy, for religious, and she's doing amazing retreats for them. And what I love most about Sister Miriam is not just simply that she got her master's in theology at the Augustine Institute, which we're very proud of and thrilled about, but she speaks from the heart to the heart. And uh, I, I just love, Sister Miriam, uh, your being able to really reach out and share the vulnerability of your heart and your story to connect with others and to give them hope uh, for healing. It's really a phenomenal ministry you have. Mm. Well, hi, Dr. Gray. Thank you yeah. so much. And I'm delighted to be here with you today. And I remember you back from being one of your students <laughs> many years ago in one of your scripture classes. And so I, I love the Augusta Institute and I love what y'all are doing. And it's always just a beautiful thing to be part of whatever you guys are up to. So thank you. Well, speaking of suffering, you had to suffer me as a professor, but you've made that into a greater good in the end. So <laughs> it was great. I loved you and Dr. Screen, Dr. Reyes. I was just, it was just great, Dr. Tyrion. Like, yeah, I still see your names, you know, out around in different events, and so it's just great. It's a, a lovely kindred, kindred souls there. So I'm very grateful. Absolutely. Well, you know, I, I know, and uh, it's so funny in your background. You, you played volleyball in college with a scholarship, and then you did a communications degree. And mm -hmm. God kind of pulled you into, that was kind of providential because you were going to become a professional volleyball player. No, you're going to become <laughs> a great communicator. So you did this communication degree and now God's using you to communicate the gospel to so many people. It's really, really, did you ever see that happening? Mm -hmm. No, no, I did not. And I, I, we, you, we were, you and I were chatting before we started the show this evening. And uh, yeah, I wanted to work for ESPN in college or <laughs> CNN or like Fox News or something, you know, something like that. And I jokingly say that Aaron Andrews stole my job, so I became a nun instead. But <laughs> I, I love, I, I mean, I love the media. I love just like the whole kind of mode of spreading information. And mm -hmm. you no, know, so when I did join Religious Life, which was a surprise to everybody, including myself, <laughs> I, the, the first thought I had was, oh my gosh, I should have been pre med. Or I should have been a nurse or a doctor or something where it could be use, useful to, to God. And then he ended up just opening all these doors um, of being able to, uh, yeah, to just to bring his heart to people. And it's, it's, it is such a tremendous responsibility and a tremendous gift to be able to bring the heart of Christ to people, to hear people's stories, to 
to see people encounter the Lord, it's, it, it is holy ground. And I say that in all sincerity and truth, it's such a humbling thing to be able to do that. And I'm, I'm just, yeah, just deeply humbled by that. Well, I think it's ironic that you mentioned the idea of being a doctor, a nurse, or helping people. And, and you picked out the idea of healing there because your ministry is really, if I had to give one characteristic from all the talks I've heard, it's really about healing the heart, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, it truly is, Dr. Gray. It, it is. And I think that comes from, you know, the messenger always bears the message. And, mm. they, they, you know, if you're going to bear it, you bear it. You bear it heart, mind, body, and soul. And it came from a lot of my own wrestling with my own suffering mm. and a lot of my own darkness. And I was an addict and just all kinds of things happening. And I, there's so many times in my life where I hit bottom and I said, you know, there has to be there has to be more to life than this. And God has always spoken to me through suffering. And so wrestling with that and now journeying with so many other people who wrestle with it and just being on the journey with people, like the, the conversion happens till this very day that I sit before you here. I, I, I don't stand on stage and say, hey, you know, I'm not going to pontificate to you on how to live. All I'm going to do is invite you on a journey that where the Jesus is inviting me and where I've seen him invite other people and let's go together. And that's a whole holy, you know, healing isn't fixing. Jesus doesn't come to fix us. Mm. He comes to bring us into wholeness and communion because, you know, as we know, Jesus comes to reconcile everything to the father. So that means he's reconciled everything, everything mentally, emotionally, spiritually, physically, sexually, he's, inter he's reconciling everything to God within us and then out in creation at large. So that, that always happens first and foremost within, otherwise, otherwise it's not efficacious. You know, you've said so much there and I want to just take one thread and that is, the suffering, you know, a lot of people suffer in their life and they suffer from others, right? I mean, yeah. you, and the injustice or something just cruelty, um, you know, that people suffer from the hands of others, whether it's abuse of some, some, mm -hmm. some form or another. And I think a lot of people wonder like, why, if God loves me, why, why did that happen to me? You know, uh, I, I, you know that's, that's always a question when people come down with an illness or something like that happens. Why did, why did God let this happen to me? And yet I remember somebody early on saying that when you have a wound or a hurt, uh, you can use that to ha as you heal from that and as you grapple with that, it gives you, a, it opens your heart to empathy for the woundedness and hurting of others. And so mm -hmm. do you find that to be true? Mm -hmm. That, that's a great question. And I think anybody who has ever thought seriously about their life or noticed the suffering of other people is asked, that's the human question. I think Bishop Barron says from generation to generation, that is the one question of if God is good, why am I suffering? Or why do people that don't deserve, why are they suffering? That That's the human question everybody asks because we grapple with the existence of good and evil in our own lives and in the world at large. And so it forces us to really ask the hard questions of who is God and who am I? And, and what is it? What does it mean to love? And what's happening is Christ. It's it's Christ sharing his life with us. It's Christ coming into every experience of our life. It's it's the Paschal mystery. It's it's through him, with him, and in him that I was just reading. I'm just writing a chapter on, for a book, an upcoming book for a publishing company, and just you know, talking about this very thing of Isaiah 53, where it's by his stripes that we are healed. And so you and I have. A God who loves us so deeply, he becomes one with us. He's a man like us, all things but sin, but then he takes on our sin. He takes on every temptation. He takes on every abuse, every struggle, every fear we have, because that's the kind of intimacy that he brings us into, which means that there's no moment of our life where we've ever been alone or abandoned or forgotten. And so us taking the experiences that we have that are very deep and very hard for us to understand and bringing them to the wisdom and the light of the Paschal mystery and seeing what God does in that. And, and that's, and he takes us from mm -hmm. the crucifixion to the resurrection. Like these are mm -hmm. true. This is our daily life. Like this mm -hmm. is Christianity. This, this is what's mm -hmm. happening here. Well, that's a beautiful roadmap. And I want to explore a little bit more with you from going from crucifixion to resurrection, but I want to invite yeah. our audience to send us your questions. We have a text line where you could text questions to sister Miriam, uh, 720 six five zero zero one hundred so please text us your questions seven two zero six five zero zero one hundred just tell us your name and and uh or you can put anonymous and just ask a question and join the conversation that would be great well sister miriam for somebody who's hurting with a wound from somebody else what's yeah. the first step like I, like I i want to be healed right they, they and they don't know what to do what's the first step in that process of healing for them 
I think many times the first step is just admitting there's a problem. Mm. <laughs> and for a lot of us, for a lot of us, if you ask people how they're doing, the, the standard answer in our society is good, busy. Like good, busy, which, you know, God forbid we're not busy because it's like a mark of how we, how we, you know, feel like we're valuable. Right. And, but, and what I found, but what I found that like, that's just the tip of the iceberg, but I really believe that for the, for the majority of human beings, right underneath the proverbial iceberg, right underneath the water is a whole well of, of unhealed wounds, of sorrow, of, mm. of disappointments, of fear, of anxiety, of hopes, of dreams, of all kinds of things just under the water. So I think even first of all, admitting that our, that our hearts are hurting or that a relationship you're in is, 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 str is struggling, or there's, there's something that happened to you. That's, that's hard for your heart. That's, that's the, that's where Christ comes to meet us. I was just talking to somebody dropped a quote the other day that said, um, Jesus comes to meet us where we are, not where we pretend to be. You know, mm. and all of us, you know, all of us have ways, myself included, we have ways of pretending and the Lord's like, no, I'd like to be, I'd like to be where you are actually. <laughs> so I'm not afraid of that. I'm not disappointed in you. I'm not disgusted by you, but can you open your heart there and ask Jesus to come and start there? And and that's where it really, where it really begins. And I, I really believe in how God heals us in so many different ways. There's so many ways of, of 12 step meetings, of course, the sacraments of reconciliation of the Eucharist, of, of counseling meetings, of 12 step meetings, of all kinds of like, even what science is proving now about how the brain heals itself. It's just so fascinating what God is doing. Mm. But first and foremost, we have to be willing to open our hearts there and to be very, very honest and, and ask the Lord to come in to come in because we can't, we can't heal ourselves. And, and that's the beautiful thing is it's, it's a frustrating thing is that it's Jesus who comes to bring us into community relationship. He's not mm -hmm. trying to fix us or he's not asking us to fix ourselves. It's, it's about relationship. What, what do you think is, what, what makes that hard for people to do that first step? What, what's, what's the anxiety? What's the fear? What holds people back from that vulnerability and that just saying, I need help? I think, I think there's a lot of things that hold us back. I think part of it is fear. Part of us is shame. We feel ashamed that we're not per like, we have this idea that somehow our wounds make us unlovable, mm. it, which is not true. Like our wounds mm. do not make us unlovable. Our, mm. our insecurities do not make us unlovable. And sometimes there's people in our life that tell us that and, and they're wrong because they're mm. mistaken. And, and Jesus, we say that out of our own brokenness to other people, but that's not how Jesus sees us. Like you see him ris risen with his wounds mm. and his wounds are not a source of shame. Like even on the cross, he's, mm. he's literally naked and he's bleeding out. He's not ashamed. Like he's, so he's teaching us, he's teaching us how to be human, of where mm. to take our woundedness. And I think it's fear, it's, it's shame. It's, it's our self-reliance. It's our pride. It's, it's so I, Dr. Gray, when I hit up against my own poverty, mm. it's very humbling. It is very humbling to have to sit at the foot of the cross with Jesus mm. and just say, I can't, I'm so poor here. And I, I can't do anything about it. And I need, I need you. I'm vulnerable, dependent. I need you. That is so terrifying for us. We're wow. afraid to be abandoned. We're afraid. And what we, but it's, it's in these very places yeah. where we not just intellectually know Jesus, but we know him experientially. And the two must come together because that's where transformation takes place. We mm. have to allow him into our deepest places to intimately know him like we know him here so he can bring our hearts into his and, and bring us to, to new life. That's well, how that, it works. Yeah, there's no other way around it. It's <laughs> so beautiful. And I, it really leads to a great question that Jenna asks. And she says, look, I have a sinful past. So what can I do to feel worthy of being a good Catholic? So I know oh. you, I'm so glad she asked that question to you. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. And I love that scripture is full of stories like mm. that because our past also doesn't make us mm. unworthy of love. Jesus never shames a sinner ever, never. He, he speaks the truth in love. He, he calls us to excellence. He calls us to truth. He calls us to turn away from sin, but he never, he never shames us. And all of us have a good reason why we do what we do. Even today, n sin is not random. Mm -hmm. Our wounds are not random. Mm -hmm. Our ways of how we interact with people or why we don't, or why we guard our heart or why we push people away. It's all strategic. It's all telling us something about our heart. And so trying to help us when we sit with the Lord and we ask the Holy spirit in our day-to-day -day life, like, why am I, why am I doing this? Like what's, what's happening? Cause we're going beyond the symptoms to the root. So what's happening, Holy Spirit, and understanding what's at the root, that can help us understand and bring c compassion and empathy to, to why we're doing what we're doing. Because there's a good reason why, if we talk about a sinful past, I guarantee you, 
there is a good reason why that happened. And it, it's largely because our hearts are tremendously broken. Mm. And this is where like St. Julian of Norwich says, when God sees our sin, he sees our pain. Mm. And so as we take these places to the sacrament of reconciliation, as we continue to allow Jesus to come there, it, it brings healing and truth because Jesus doesn't ever say those things. The things we say to ourselves, oh gosh, he doesn't say those things to us. Like he tells us the yeah. truth and love and that's what brings new life. Yeah. I love what uh, St. Augustine, when he goes through his confessions and he talks about how broken and enslaved he was to sin and selfish he was, he constantly goes back in the confessions. Uh, every time I read it, I, this theme starts to emerge in a clearer picture. And he, Augustine says, uh, and calls out to God's mercy. And so, you know, one of the things when I think of Jenna's question, and so many people say this, what can I do to be worthy of God's love? And the thing is, we don't have to do anything to be worthy of God's love, right? Mm -hmm. And, and that's, that's the, we just have to accept it. But it's hard, isn't it, for people to it just is. accept, you know, that grace means gift. It doesn't, it's, it's not earned. And God's love is, is a grace. It is a gift. We don't have to earn it. We don't have to be worthy of it. We just have to be open and receiving it. And mm -hmm. do you, do you do you find that that a lot of people struggle with that? They want it. They want to well, be worthy. Oh, that's a good point. I think we all do, Doctor. I mm -hmm. think very honestly, we all do. And I that that kind of love of freedom, of the vulnerability of a love that doesn't require us to perform or mm -hmm. to take control, or a love that just gifts. It's like it's what we deeply ache for the most, but we also what we fear. And it's just so interesting of, and just all the lies we believe about ourselves and about love and about like, those are strongholds that often block out kind of our receptivity. But I love that you use the word receptive because mm. that word literally means to take into oneself mm. and that's very vulnerable. And so for us to sit with the Lord and receive his kindness, which is so unnerving for us and yeah. to receive his love there and to receive his truth there is what we we deeply long for and i think when we can ask the lord to help us like jesus i don't know how to let you love me like i don't know how not to perform for love i don't know how to do this can you come help me some teach me because i don't know yeah. and it's that kind of honesty where that's opens our hearts to a, a deeper level of of being able to receive it just like lord help me i don't, I don't know how to do this i love <laughs> no, that so I, I love me. that just the simple I don't know, and, and yes. just that confession. And I, I think, know. I think that's why faith is faith. Faith depends on trust. We we have to trust that God loves us, and I yes. think that that's the hardest thing to believe, is mm -hmm. that the God who moved and made the sun, the moon, and the stars, actually loves me, a sinner, and all my selfishness and all all my smallness, and mm -hmm. that 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 the Creator loves even the smallest of His creatures. Um, I think that's really hard for us to trust in that. And that's really where the battle takes place. And probably the battle for healing is a constant mm -hmm. struggle for trusting God's mercy and love. Mm -hmm. Teresa, oh, very true. Yeah, Teresa asks on form, why does Jesus heal some but not others? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a great question. And I think we have to define what it means to be healed. Mm -hmm and what that really looks like because in the in the scriptures it says that jesus heals all who came to him it says mm. he cast out demons like he anybody that came to that touched him were healed and so kind of looking at those gospel accounts which i'm sure you know much deeper on the, the original language and just kind of what the what the the writer intends there but there's nobody that doesn't come to christ who doesn't come away with some form of healing if they're mm. open and so our idea of healing though is is often very different than what the Lord's idea of healing is. And so if we talk about healing versus communion and relationship and intimacy, that puts a different paradigm on it versus fix me or make this better in my life mm. so that I can go on my way. And I don't know, like sometimes healings happen dramatically. Sometimes people are physically healed, they're emotionally healed. Sometimes marriages are dramatically healed. And sometimes in life, it appears that nothing happened. But like you said, the, the reality of trusting, of, of taking that to the Lord and, and on my part, doing what the Lord is asking me to do in my own journey mm -hmm. of that, that there's nobody that comes to the Lord that doesn't come away with, with deeper community or deeper intimacy or deeper healing. And so I think continually to offer those places to the Lord and to know that that's everything on earth is ordered toward eternal communion. So mm -hmm. healings are always ordered toward communion and relationships. So whatever kind of healing it is, it's always about relationship and communion, which is a foretaste of eternity when everything will be consummated. And so I think understanding that in our life of like, when there's things that are happening in our life that we don't understand, like we, we've all had, we've all prayed for people. We've all prayed for ourselves in places and we still see our own poverty. And it's such a temptation of the enemy 
to come and try to push us to, to lie to us and tell us, see, God doesn't hear you, doesn't, but we know objectively it's not true because of who God says he is. So I think being very honest about those places of ache, like the Psalms are full of that. Mm, <laughs> and there's a book yeah. in the Old Testament called Lamentations, you know, just like <laughs> the places where mm. grief pours out, where life did not turn out the way we thought it would. And still in that place saying, Lord, I, I'm going to trust you still and, and trust that you're doing something. I'm so little, I'm so little, and you're doing something far beyond anything I can possibly imagine. Mm. I love, I love that answer. And I love that your idea that everybody who comes to Jesus, he heals. And then the idea that too, mm-hmm. it's, it, this isn't just about physical, you know, in no. Luke 11, Jesus talks about, you know, what father among you would give a serpent if his child asked for bread or a fish. Yes. And, and then he says, mm-hmm. you know, whatever you ask in the Father's name, he'll give you. And then he tells us what that is. He promises yeah. to always give the Holy Spirit, which is himself, mm-hmm. right? And so mm-hmm. he'll always give grace. That doesn't mean, like you said before, that he'll always give physical healing because sometimes he, in his plan, that's not the best thing for us in the end. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, I'm sure Joseph, prayed for deliverance, you know, um, from slavery and, yes. you know, oh, and if gosh. God would have given it to him that next day, he wouldn't have saved Egypt. If he would have given it to him the next month, it wouldn't, he wouldn't have been able to save Israel in Egypt. If God had given it a year or two down the road healing, he couldn't have been there to rescue and save, uh, the 12, uh, his 12 brothers and, and his father, Jacob. And so he had to suffer for a long time to be in that place where God intended to use him. And, mm-hmm. uh, and now we know his story because of, of how God used him in that suffering. So I think that's really important. Well, one of the I great- I agree with you. Oh yeah, go ahead if you want to add to that. Oh no, that's just amen, oh, amen, that's yeah. very true, yeah. Well, one of the questions people have here, and this is a question I hear a lot right now, and it's really a great wound for people, I think, and they're hurting. And someone, uh, a caller asks on the text line, I have a child in college who has left the church. How can I bring them back? Right? So uh, first off, they're hurting for their child. And then really, secondly, how do we, how do we bring that? How do we, what, what advice do we give them? Mm-hmm. Oh gosh, yes, that's so hard, isn't it? It is so yeah. hard. And I, I really believe in, I, I really believe the most powerful gospel that you and I will ever preach is how we live our day-to-day life. Mm-hmm. That no matter what people's way of life, no matter what they believe, they, if they look at our life and they see that we love Christ, and that we live differently, that will plant seeds, whether we see them this side of heaven or not. And so the first and foremost, I think that we, that we are living a life of authentic discipleship with Christ like that. We have to do that. There's no, there's no other way around it than that. So, and then from that, from that offering prayer and fasting for your loved ones who have fallen away from the church. And then from that place, entering into intentional dialogue with them, mm-hmm. if you can, about kind of what they think about certain things, like, right? you know, or what happened or, you know, kind of like, what are their views on God or what, you know, because everybody has a reason why, like we said, the reason why they do what they do, even if they think they don't, they do. So kind of what's, what's happening there. And it, 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 that it's invitational and that we're inviting people to consult really the deepest desires of their hearts. And so, mm-hmm. You know, nobody's ever criticized or condemned into a conversion. We're all loved into one. <laughs> and a, that oh. happens every day. Like we are continually yeah. loved into a conversion. So yeah. it, I think there's a I, there's a such a balance there of 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 wanting as a parent your child to come back to the church and wanting to make that happen <laughs> versus yeah. tr- and trusting them to our late. My mom my mom did that for me. She got so sick of me one night and I was just so far beyond her control that she just gave me away to our lady one night and that mm. She prayed and fasted for me. And I know that's part of the reason why I'm sitting here before you today. And so the prayers of, of ones that love you are very powerful, but we must attend to our own spiritual garden first and to really make sure like mm. that's what we're doing. And then we're going that, taking that to the Lord and then the overflow of that into the lives of other people. I love the three points you give because it's, it's exactly the formula of, of St. Monica, right? She, yep. she becomes a saint loving her husband, who's a very difficult man and not, not a Christian until his, his deathbed pretty much. And her son, who's you know fallen away, Augustine, was you know an adolescent who went after the things of this world, and it broke Monica's heart. But she she prayed diligently for him. She lived a very noble Christian life, and she mm-hmm. prayed, she fasted, she wept, and she kept you know she would hound Augustine, but, you know like any mother, maybe yeah. too much. Augustine wanted to be on a different continent from her, uh, going to <laughs> Europe from Africa, <laughs> but. Uh, but Monica won in the end, right? And uh, there's no St. Augustine without a St. Monica. So I Amen. think you're, you're, and I just say too to people, that pain that you feel for your child, that, you're, that ache of being worried, 
turn that ache and that, that, that pain into that constructive energy of fasting and praying and trying to love Christ more and be more faithful. Use that pain to love Christ and, mm-hmm. and love your child and pray for them. And mm-hmm. I know as a parent, there's nothing that puts you on your knees more, more quickly than your children, right? And when you're worried about them and their welfare. And uh, I know there's, you know, the, the agony in the garden for parents is their anxious agony for their kids. So um. I share that person's, <laughs> I, I, I know how they feel. Um, and uh, just use St. Monica as an example. Well, mm-hmm. Matt asks a question for you. Uh, this is great. How did you know God was calling you to be a nun? So mm. I, well, I look back on my life now and I see the deep desire to, for love. I had such a deep desire for love, to love and to mm. be loved. And through my own trauma responses and my own tremendously sinful, just life that I was living. I was really looking for love. Like that's mm-hmm. what I've learned after all these years underneath that all was a tremendous, uh, I, and I wanted to give myself t- totally. I wanted to give my life to something that mattered. Mm-hmm. And so, uh, God sent a Catholic priest into my life, which is the other reason why I'm here today. Um, who, somebody who lived radically, somebody who I'd never met somebody holy like that, where he, Christ would just emanate from him. Mm-hmm. And that's why I believe in the power of personal witness. Cause you can't fake that. And it was through his like mentoring of me that it, through me- meeting Christ in him, like we talk about, there's no Augustine without an Ambrose either. Like mm-hmm. it's through meeting Christ through this priest that like changed my paradigm of like, oh, God is real. Like these things really, like God's love is real. And it was through the kindness and the tenderness and the truth telling of this priest that enabled me to hear Jesus. And I had a distinct moment in my heart where, where God spoke to me very deeply and I knew this was exactly what I was supposed to do with my life. And I could see it building up in the desires that I'd had my whole life, but I just couldn't, I couldn't interpret them. And they were so broken by trauma that um, I couldn't make sense of them. But now I look back, I'm like, oh, that's what God, that's what God was about. And this deep peace came into my heart, mm. a, a tremendously deep peace of, you know, even though like you in your own life, your own marriage, there's, there's good days and there's hard days and there's beautiful days, but but love, you know, love brings us into excellence. And that's what I wanted to love. I wanted to love excellently. Mm, that is beautiful. What advice do you give to people? This would be, uh, how do they persevere on the road to healing, right? People who've been hurt, people who've suffered a lot. How do they persevere on that road to healing? Mm-hmm. I would say ask Jesus, ask Jesus for the, the grace to do so, because this is ultimately mm-hmm. about a communion with him where he's the one who's with us at every moment. He's attending to us. He's hearing our hearts. And and it can, in the road, like anything else, we can just lay down by the side of the road and say, sometimes it's, it is really hard, mm. but it's worth it. People ask me all the time, is it worth it? Mm. Is it worth it? It is it worth it to go to the depths of your heart? Is it worth it to face your fears? Is it worth it to tell the truth? Is it worth it wow. to face your deepest vulnerabilities? And I say yes and yes and mm. yes, because there is no other way than through the suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And that is our life. And it is worth it. Oh, that's such a beautiful call for all of us to hear and just to be reminded of, right? It is yes. worth it. And yeah. uh, it's worth it. And it's, it's uh, you know, it's funny. I think suffering is, you know, as Augustine would say, an evil is a lack of a good. And mm-hmm. I think the greatest path to healing that, that you know, that depravity of, of the good, right, mm-hmm. is love. It's yes. all, the only thing that can fill that empty space is yes. love. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So how, how do you go about taking love as, as your, as your pill, as your healing yeah. medicine for your life? Yeah. What it keeps you loving? Uh, I can, I mean, honestly, the, the Lord does. And I, mm-hmm. I, this is my daily life. Like everything I've shared with you today, this is my daily life. This is my mm-hmm. morning prayer. This is my heart mm-hmm. check throughout the day. This is when things trouble me or hurt me. This is me going to the Holy Spirit and saying, Lord, Holy Spirit, what's happening right now? This is when people hurt my heart heart where I'm asking Lord what's happening, where I'm, you know, trying to understand their own heart. Like this is, this is, I, I really mean like, this is the real deal. And so I don't, I have lived other ways and I, I just don't know another way to live. It's just, I don't know other way to live than this. And the fact that Christ is so incredibly beautiful, I've, I've never met a man that beautiful. Mm. Like he is so stunningly lovely and just so I, I, I look at him and I, I don't have another answer. Like, I don't, how could I not 
allow him to help me love like he loves? How could I not let me, him touch my deepest places? How could I not let him transform these places? And mm. I just, I can't live another way. Like I, I just, I, I, I just can't. Uh, and so it's, it's his grace that does that. Yeah. You know, sister Miriam, I, thank you for that. And thank you for the time today and, and being on the show with us and sharing. Cause I think what inspires all of us, and I hope all of the, our audience sees this is that your authentic love, um, shines out. And I think it's the, exactly what you're a witness of that's going to reform and heal the church is mm -hmm. the only path to reform. The only path to healing is authentic love and loving. And that we need that in the church, we need it for ourselves and we need it for the world. So thank you so much mm -hmm. for being with us. I can't thank you enough for all that you do. And uh, I'm very grateful for you joining us. So Oh, thank you, Dr. Gray. It's been a delight to spend time with you. Thank you so much. Oh, that's terrific. And I just want to let everybody know that next week, uh, Dr. Elizabeth Klein, who's a professor here at the Augustine Institute, is going to be our guest. And we're going to talk about her new Bible studies, her Lexio Bible study series that we have called Lexio God. And it's on the Trinity. And uh, it's, you know, a, Trinity is a big term. It's something kind of intimidating. And Dr. Klein is so down to earth and practical. She's she has a book uh, that we published here at the Augustine on God that I really recommend. And I love, by the way, Sister Mary, SALT, your religious order, yes. which is yeah. the Society of Our Lady the Trinity. And I think it's very mm -hmm. clever because you get Our Lady in there and you get all three yeah. persons of the Trinity. No, I think it's one of the most the clever stuff. religious yeah. names of an order <laughs> ever. So I love it. I love it. So yeah. thank you so much for uh, being a witness of Our Lady and the Trinity and all that you do. May the Lord bless and thank keep you. you and bless all of our audience. Thank you so much. Take care.